Hello and welcome to my channel. My name is Chuck and you're watching Let's Plant. Now before we begin, I'd like to give a shout out to Lyndon's channel. Thank you so much for your support, man. Now we shall begin. In previous episodes, we've discussed dormancy and succulents and we have learned that this is largely to do with temperature and humidity. Now, in some climates, you don't have to do anything because your climate would be doing the heavy lifting for you. But in others, you might not be as fortunate and you have to set up a proper greenhouse to simulate the various seasons. In this episode, we're going to discuss the different seasons and how they affect our plants. Before we talk about all of these changes, we first need to understand how the seasons work. So the four seasons in the year, winter, spring, summer, or autumn, <laughs> it refers to the weather patterns and the daylight hours. And these are affected by the Earth's relative position to the sun. There's so much information about this topic, so let's just look at one of the articles online to save us some time. So I have here an article from ABC Science titled, Spring, Summer, Autumn, and Winter, Why Do We Have Seasons? This is quite a long article, so I'm going to just cherry pick some sections of it. But in case you want to read it yourself, here's a link and you could also find it in the description. Anyway, here goes. Only a few parts of the world would experience the classic four seasons of spring, summer, autumn, and winter. Many parts of the world get only two or even one. So what's going on? Every day, the Earth spins once on its axis, but our planet isn't perfectly upright when it spins, thanks to a few collisions during its formation. The Earth is tilted at an angle of 23.5 degrees. This means that as the Earth takes its annual trip around the Sun, different areas of the planet face the Sun more directly during their daylight hours at different times of year. The tilt also affects the daily amount of light. Without it, the whole planet would have 12-hour days and nights every day of the year. In summer, the days are longer because more hours are spent facing the Sun and they're hotter because we're facing the Sun more head-on. So we get hit by more rays of sunlight than if we were on an angle. The tables turn six months later when the Earth is halfway around its orbit of the Sun. The northern hemisphere solstice, the longest day, matches our winter solstice around June 22 when the Sun is as far north as it goes, above the Tropic of Cancer. So just reverse it depending on which hemisphere you're in. This article is based on the southern hemisphere in case you are wondering. So take that into consideration. In spring and autumn, the planet isn't tilted towards or away from the sun, it's roughly side-on. And for two days each year, the Earth's tilt is exactly side-on to the sun, and the two days are called equinoxes, or equal nights. And they fall into the middle of spring and autumn, usually on September 22 and March 22. On an equinox, night and day are equal length everywhere on the planet. But spring and autumn only happen in mid-latitude areas of our planet. It's a different story in the tropics and at the frozen ends of the planet. Tropics and poles. Some parts of the polar regions are so consistently cold and the tropics so hot that they could pass for having only one season. Even the sunniest Antarctic day is as cold as winter in most places. This is because the light reaching the bottom of the planet is, such, is at such a low angle it doesn't carry much heat. On the other hand, the tropics are consistently hot. It doesn't matter if they are tilted towards or away from the sun. They're still closer to it than anywhere else on Earth. And they get plenty of direct light and heat. But both places have two distinct seasons. In the polar regions, the main difference comes down to the amount of daylight. During summer, the whole area is tilted towards the sun and flooded with sunlight. Daytime at the poles lasts half the year. And the polar night lasts almost as long making for very one long dark winter. In the tropics, the differences between the two seasons is mainly due to the rainfall. The wet is caused by a permanent belt of storm clouds around the middle of the planet that dumps huge volumes of rain on the land or sea below. Thanks to the tilt of the planet and some supersized sea breezes, the storm belt does not stay in one place. During the northern summer, the hot air over the land rises, sucking the storm belt as far as the north of Tropic of Cancer, doling out monsoons wherever it goes. As the northern summer ends, the storms are dragged down towards the Tropic of Capricorn, driving the southern tour the monsoons. The belt travels across the equator twice a year, once going south and once on the way back up. If they've got the right combination of mountains, wind and sea temperature, some equatorial areas such as Kuala Lumpur can score two wet seasons each year. So that's quite a lot of information to take, but I'm pretty sure you've already encountered this in your science classes. 
Another confusion with the seasons is exactly when they start. Some countries such as the US would use the solstices and equinoxes to determine, to specify the dates, the start and end of each season. Other countries such as us in Australia would use calendar months to mark the start and end of the seasons. These two systems have their own pros and cons. The system that's based on equinoxes and solstices would be the astronomical season, while the system that's based on calendar months would be the meteorological seasons. So like I said earlier, astronomical seasons is where you're basing off on solstices and equinoxes. And this is basically us checking the relative position of the Earth and the Sun and being very pedantic about the amount of daylight that you're getting in a year. On the other hand, the meteorological system is what some people would call artificial in that this is not based on how nature works. This is mainly a system to simplify things, to keep everything on the same date. Because the problem with the other system, the astronomical system, is that the, the days differ every year. It ranges from the 19th to the 22nd of the month. For instance, in the Southern Hemisphere, if you follow the astronomical seasons, then spring would start somewhere between the September of 19 to the 22nd. This year, it would be on the 20th. Autumn starts somewhere in the 19th to the 22nd of March. In this case, again, 2019, it would fall on the 20th of the month. You could just reverse those two for the Northern Hemisphere. So your spring would be starting on the 20th of March and your autumn or fall would start on the 20, 20th of September. The reason why we have the fixed date system is that it makes it a lot easier to do forecasts, to do averages, to do reports based on fixed seasons. And it makes it a lot easier to compare seasons and year to year because everything is falling on the same month same date range, there's no wiggle room. But I'm sharing this part because it pays to know both systems. That way you would not be surprised why. Because here in Australia, we, we follow the meteorological system and it is technically autumn now, but it still doesn't feel like it. We have lots of hot days yet. And that's mainly because it's not yet actually summer according to the other system. So we have a few more weeks. Now that we have the basics, let's talk about what happens to Echeveria and other succulents across seasons. Spring. In spring, things start warming up. This is a comfortable range for many genera, so you'll find that most summer dormant and winter dormant plants are actively growing. A lot of Echeveria species, such as those based on Agaboides, Colorata, Elegans, and many others, would start flowering. You'll also notice that the leaves are slowly rising up as if trying to catch more water. That is a fortunate side effect, but this has mostly to do with the increasing amount of daylight during the day. Of course, during the day, you don't get... Towards the end of spring, assuming it gets warm enough, the winter dormant plants such as the Aeonium start getting dormant, and you'll see signs of this when they start closing up a bit and the green on their leaves are starting to fade. They tend to be darker. Echeveria, on the other hand, would start losing their stress colors. They would go pale and even start turning green. And by the second or third month of spring, they would have lost a lot of their stress colors. I also think that spring is a great time to try germinating Echeveria seeds because the ambient temperature is just right for them to grow. And this is if you don't use a special controlled environment such as a greenhouse or, I don't know, heating pad or grow lights. And you're only doing it outdoors like I am. Summer. At the start of summer, things are still comfortable enough for Echeveria that you'll notice that they are at the peak of their growth. As it gets warmer due to the length of day, the leaves would start closing in on itself and this also allows them to protect the inner growth on their apical meristems. Their leaves will grow the biggest during this time but you won't notice because they tend to be pointing upwards. But if you take photos before summer and after summer, you would definitely notice a difference in terms of size and the density of the leaves because there would be a lot more leaves at the end of summer. Aeoniums would get their stress colors, especially if they're exposed to the sun. The dark varieties would be so dark and the rosettes would be so shut tight. The Aeonium aureum, for instance, is so shut tight that it's, it gets its signature rose-like look during this time. When you're lucky or unlucky, depending on how you look at it, there's a chance that Aeoniums would push out flowers during this time. And I say unlucky because Aeoniums are monocarpic. And what this means is that they can only produce flowers through the main stalk. And during this time, what happens is that the rosette elongates and from it, lots of flower buds would form. As the flowers bloom and dry out, the main stem would start wilting from the tip and this wilt, this rot would go down gradually onto the main stem. But this process takes months, a few months, and hopefully by then, a lot of pups would have grown from the base of the stem. So while the main plant itself would die, 
the offsets would live on. The same thing could also happen to Echeveria, but Echeveria are polycarpic, which means that aside from flowering from the main stalk, they are also able to push out separate flower stalks as offsets, like this one. And that way, only this part, only this bit would dry out and leaving the main rosette intact. Most of the time you would be getting this, but sometimes you get terminal stalks, and that's when you're unlucky. When it gets hot enough, somewhere in the 35 degrees Celsius range or 95 Fahrenheit, the Echeveras will start getting dormant, protecting themselves. They would reduce their metabolism so much that they would not appear to be growing as much. This is mainly a response to the heat and they would resume their growth once the temperatures are more favorable. And I'm able to mitigate this by setting up shade structures on top of my plants. I personally set up shade structures once the ambient temperature goes up to 30 degrees on average or 86 degrees Fahrenheit, I think. In my location, I use 30% shade cloth because I still want them to look a bit stressed. That way, I could take nice photos of them. But if you're only concerned about growth, then you would want to go with a heavier or uh, something with a higher rating such as 50 or 70%. But this is something that you would have to figure out for yourself because it might be filtering out so much light that they would start getting leggy. It's a mix and match. Younger plants are not as heat tolerant as the mature plants, so you'd want to keep them under filtered light or in bright shade. Around midsummer, the larger varieties such as the Gibifloras and their hybrids, and I've also seen this with my Kante, they start pushing out flower stalks. I'm not sure why they run on a slightly different schedule compared to the others, but I have a feeling that they have a different active temperature range, active growing. They are probably able to withstand more heat, or maybe they start going dormant at higher temperatures. But that's just my theory, I haven't proven it yet because I haven't been checking it that much. If you have seedlings, you might want to protect them from intense heat, so you'll have to place them in bright shade. Autumn. When things start cooling down, Echeveria would be going out of their dormancy first, and they would start growing. You would see lots of growth and activity during the first few months of autumn. Many Echeveria varieties would be putting out flower stalks during this time, especially if you had a particularly hot summer, because it would force them to be dormant. So as they wake up, flower spikes. And during this time, since the daylight is getting shorter, Echeveras would start putting their leaves down and this reveals their true size, their true uh, maximum size. This is when I usually take measurements and compare them against the previous seasons or previous years. During this time, Aeoniums would start opening up again and the centers start turning green. This is also a great time to try germinating Echeveria seeds because the temperature is just right to do it outdoors. Although again, you could do it all year round if you have a controlled setup, so keep that in mind. I also tend to work on my landscaping projects during this time. Winter. During winter, Aeoniums lose a lot, if not all of their stress colors, rendering them mostly green. Their leaves are no longer curled inwards and they are laying flat, almost perpendicular to the stem. This gives them this rough, very messy, scraggly look. Some people, myself included, would think that they would look the least presentable during this time. But you have to forgive them for that. This is them just trying to increase their surface area so much so they could catch a lot of sunlight. They're actively growing anyway. And also due to this reduced daylight, Echeveria leaves would be open so much, like I said earlier, their leaves would start pointing downwards. You would see this happening when you do not give your Echeveras enough light anyway. But in this case, since it's starting to get colder, their growth rate is reduced, which means that they do not have a tendency to go leggy or atheolated. If you have seedlings, you might want to start thinking about how to protect them against the cold later on. So either you move them indoors under grow lights or, I don't know, be creative. Young plants, especially seedlings, are particularly prone to frost damage. So you have to watch out for that. Towards the end of the month, specifically the 20th of March, we would be entering the astronomical autumn here in the Southern Hemisphere, which means that for those of you in the Northern Hemisphere, you'd be entering your astronomical spring on the 20th. And by then, the average temperatures for us would be a lot cooler since we have already exited summer. When that happens, I'll be finally removing the shade cloth and shade structures over my plants because they won't need it anymore. And by that time, I would resume working on my landscapes again. But before I do that, I need to do some preparation and that would be preparing another batch of soil 
So I think in future episodes, it would be a good idea to talk about my soil mix. If you want to hear my thoughts on the matter, make sure to subscribe and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye. Special thanks to all of my Patreon supporters, especially Oscarino, Julie Seal, Snap Quig, Lauren Minotti, Camila Reyes, Linda Leal, Gwen Ott, Q2, Jesse May, and Ronin Perez. Thank you so much. Without your help, a lot of this is not possible. You should also check out my website, seriscapes.com. I have a plant shop and seriscapedia section right there. I push updates once in a while, so make sure to check back from time to time. And finally, follow me on Instagram, that's at seriscapades. I post a photo of an Echeveria every single day under the hashtag daily Echeveria.